Okay, so this is uh, picture 26. Okay, so let me quickly summarize where we are as far as LDPC codes are concerned. We began by looking at uh, WR, no, WCWR, WCWR regular LDPC codes. Okay, so and then we so mostly we've been looking at all of all of these guys over a binary symmetric channel so far okay so the decoder we saw was a Gallagher decoder we saw density evolution Gallagher A decoding and then we saw density evolution for Gallagher A decoding for this and then for say the lambda x rho x LDPC okay so what are the various things we saw we saw uh, construction did we see construction well, the socket construction is uh, one thing that I talked about, but there are so many other things when you went, want to actually construct an LDPC matrix and hopefully people who are doing, the, doing their project in that area will, will probably, uh, probably work on that. Uh, so, so by the way, I don't know if I made this very clear. So the presentation has to be done by everybody. Okay, so I don't know. I think I probably didn't put that down in the file properly. The presentation will also have to be done by the people who are doing the programming assignment okay, but they will not be graded too much on that but you'll, you'll, you'll have to do a presentation to everybody describing what you did so that you have to do you can't escape that whatever you do. okay so let me remind you so construction is one thing we saw and then we saw message passing decoding right so we'll saw just one example of message passing decoding which is the gallagher <coughs> a decoder uh, so gallagher a and there are other message passing decoders slightly more complicated like it was pointed out instead of the bit to check processing there can be some changes those also will give you other message passing decoders it's possible for all of these message passing decoders we saw this way of doing analysis which I call density evolution okay and this this gave us the threshold property which was uh, very interesting okay so so now just just to get a high high level understanding of the what these what these things are construction of an ldpc code what do you need to know to construct an ldpc code what are the various things you need to know you need to know rho x and lambda x right and then you also need the block length right so you need all three to construct a an instance of an LDPC code. Okay, from the ensemble, you construct a random instance. Okay, and to implement the message passing decoder, not only do you need the block block length and the lambda of x and rho of x, what do you need? You need the exact parity check matrix that was chosen, or the exact Tanner graph that was chosen. Okay, what about density evolution? What do you need for doing density evolution? I'm sorry, P. Okay. Well, P is different, right? It's a channel parameter, okay? So, well, let's assume that's known. That's that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the code. What about the code do you need to know? <coughs> Rho and lambda, that's it. You don't need block length. You don't need the actual matrix. You just need Rho and lambda, okay? But you needed the IID assumption, okay? So, what does that mean? The IID assumption means block length will have to be very large, okay? So, it will hold only for block length very large and only for as many iterations as allowed by your... Uh, by the minimum length cycle that you have. Okay, so all those things will be practical realities. But density evolution, the algorithm you can run just by knowing lambda of x and rho of x. So this threshold is purely a function of function of what? Lambda of x and rho of x. Okay, so those are the various things to uh, roughly keep in mind and then I briefly talked about the optimization which is an important part but uh, I didn't spend way too much time on it but okay so that's another part optimization okay so you can uh, basically you can find good rho x and lambda of x Okay, just purely in terms of threshold, which is the rho of x and lambda of x of a particular rate which gives you the best threshold. 
or you can do the other question for a particular threshold which is the highest rate possible <coughs> for me okay so both of those are ways of optimizing so you do that okay so today you even without writing all the optimization programs you can there are enough web resources available which will give you optimized degree distributions somebody has done a whole bunch of this optimization and they've collected all the good degree distributions and stored them somewhere okay so you can google for a while and you'll quickly find this website okay so the title of the website is ldpc opt okay so ldpc opt is the name of the website it's hosted in epfl by rudiger arbanke's group okay so they have a collection of all the good degree distributions so in fact you can go there and say i'm do, i'm working on a bsc thing even gallagher a is possible right you can can you pick gallagher a decoding in that seen maybe, maybe it's possible okay so you can pick your decoding and then say give me an optimized degree distribution and there are some constraints for instance you might have to fix the maximum left degree or something and then it will give you a good lambda lambda of x and rho of x okay so today you can work with ldpc codes without doing the optimization yourself okay so you can do that somebody else will give you then but but the construction and the decoder implementation you have to do <laughs> you have to do the construction you have to construct a good enough random instance okay so that's where the practical nature will come in all the other problems will come okay you might have to do simulations for it <coughs> okay any part here which you think deserves i mean something something that disturbed you in one of these things some question if you want to ask on any particular uh, essence of how the concentration how the concentration is proved <laughs> so it's 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 purely a martingale argument there is really nothing more i can say you show basically see you must have been you must know something called the have you heard of uh, the chebyshev bound chebyshev inequality or the markov inequality okay how, how does the markov inequality work for instance chebyshev inequality so you say you bound the probability that x minus expected value of x whole squared is uh, whatever you know something like that greater than some product of sigma then you bound that probability so one can imagine uh, this martingale argument is a major extension of a bound like that so you can derive a more general bound based on something okay so that's the rough sort of idea of how the concentration result is proved okay so but but look it up i mean it's not if you, you can find enough resources to understand this on the web it's not very difficult okay so now what we are going to move is we are going to move out of move to is we are going to move out of bsc then go to awg and channel bpsk awg channel and then figure out are there good message passing decoders that one can implement and analyze and talk about threshold can we design good lambda of x to of x for bpsk over awg okay so as i said that's the main selling point for <coughs> for ldpc codes the fact that they have efficient message passing soft decision decoders Okay, not just hard decision, soft decision decoders. Okay, so that's what we're going to see next. So, quick reminder of this BPSK over AWGN. Okay, so one thing I've avoided so far is the encoding. Okay, so I'll talk about it briefly maybe later on. But for now, we'll assume the encoder is is out there somewhere. Okay. So how does the how does BPSK over WGN work? If given a code word, what do you do first? You do the modulation, which I'm I'm going to write as this is the BPSK step, and then you have AWGN. Okay, some noise vector gets added. Get a received vector R. Okay, so this is your this is what your the decoder has to work with. so you'll have a decoder here which may be produces a see here okay so no no hard decision if you make a hard decision for each received value independently you go back to the bsc okay so i'm not going to do that i'm going to work with the entire received vector r which is now a real valued number vector right so this is r will belong to what r right so it's very different from <coughs> what we had before okay so so usually so we saw some we saw a couple of soft decoders right what are the two soft decoders that we saw optimal soft decoders saw two of them 
the the bitwise map and the maximum likelihood decoder okay so what did the maximum likelihood decoder do <coughs> okay so all that is abstract descriptions but in practice yeah you correlate and pick the code word which the symbol vector which gave you the maximum correlation for bpsk awg you can do that but if you want to have a more general description you can say minimum euclidean distance for instance okay so that's that's what the maximum likelihood decoder does the bitwise map decoder what does it do it's not easy to describe that's why you need the probability it actually computes the probability that a particular bit equals zero given the entire received vector r okay so we found there was one thing that was very useful in writing down expressions for those probabilities what was that the likelihood ratio right so we saw the likelihood ratio was useful and we could write the overall expression in terms of the likelihood ratio okay? and we had some simplifying formulas for that okay so the message passing decoders will try to compute approximately that probability okay so the theme behind soft decision message passing decoders is they approximate so soft decision message passing decoders are approximations of bitwise map decoders when i say approximations you don't even know how good an approximation it is theoretically but in practice you'll see in simulations it's a very good reasonably good approximation in many cases okay bitwise map decoders okay one sense in which this is definitely valid is the message passing decoders try to approximately compute probability that a particular bit equals 0 or 1 given the entire received vector r so that is the sense in which this is true okay so so basically the idea is to approximately compute probability that a particular bit is 0 or 1 say given r okay okay so 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 we saw this is the same as trying to compute the app likelihood ratio right that's so why that's so we wrote down the expression if you go back and think about it for the bitwise map decoder if you go back and look at what you what you saw what you wrote we did not try to compute this we actually tried to compute yeah so we tried to compute or this capital li which is probability that ci is zero given r divided by probability that ci is 1 given r one could also compute the log of this quantity okay in that case you get the log likelihood ratio the app log likelihood ratio a posteriori log likelihood ratio okay so one can do that also or log of li okay so that is the probability this is the likelihood ratio this is the llr which is log of the likelihood ratio okay so log base e if you want okay so if you want a basis if you want a base for your logarithm you can think of it as log base e okay so so this is what we will try to compute but the way in which the decoder works will be very similar to the gallagher a decoder okay remember how how were the decoder operations in gallagher a there were two steps in each iteration right there were there were iterations and there were two steps in each iteration right the first step was something was sent from bit nodes to check nodes okay and then in the second step <coughs> something was sent back from check node to bit node now we will send soft values from bit nodes to check nodes okay instead of sending one bit we will be sending actually real numbers okay from bit nodes to check nodes and back again okay so that's how that will be the major change but other than that the principle will be exactly the same you will be sending something from bit node to check node and check node to bit node okay so let us figure out how that how that works out okay so before that let's look at uh, one more likelihood ratio which which i think i called a small li did i call that small li okay which was the intrinsic likelihood ratio for a particular bit okay so what is the intrinsic or channel llr as it is called okay so 
so i think i called the channel likelihood ratio probability that ci is zero given ri divided by probability that ci is one given ri assuming that zero and one are equally likely this ratio will be the same as what you can use bayes rule cancel that and go to the pdf of ri given ci equals zero divided by pdf of ri given ci equals one and then you can plug in those formulas e power minus whatever and then cancel everything and finally what will you get okay this will be e to the power 2 ri by sigma square okay so this is what you would get okay so what will be the this is the intrinsic or the channel likelihood ratio what will be the channel log likelihood ratio log of this okay so i'll call that uh, what shall we call that we need a Uh, notation for that i'll call it yi okay so this is the channel llr is log of li which works out to 2 by sigma square times ri okay right so since anyway capital li is fun a function purely of the small li's right i can say capital li is purely a function of the yi's there's nothing wrong in saying that so i instead of my decoder working with ri i might as well work with yi there's nothing wrong with that okay so if yi contains all the information that's out there so i know eventually everything works out in the will will work out depending purely on li and yi i can write capital li purely as a function of li right so you saw that expression the way i wrote it down the ratio is what's important so everything is going to work out fine so i can imagine the input to my decoder being yi okay and it's very usual for 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 one to imagine that the input to the decoder is yi and not ri okay but what is the only difference between ri and yi it's a simple scaling okay so in practice it's not a big deal and we will find that this is easier to deal with okay in terms of probability because ri is not directly any probability or a probability ratio but yi is what is the ratio of log of the ratio of two probabilities okay right so so we'll see that that is in some way useful for us as we go along so we'll imagine yi being the input to the decoder okay so okay so hopefully you remember the way i developed the decoder for the gallagher a part okay so we di did it in using the tanner graph okay so what was the input to the decoder where did i assign the input to the decoders i put them next to the bit node to each bit node i assign i assign some input right so bit node i what input did i assign ri in that case now i'll assign yi which is the log likelihood ratio or channel log likelihood ratio corresponding to the particular bit that will be a natural way of assigning the input okay so that is that is the input stage okay so so okay so i'll just write that down here hopefully you can visualize a tanner graph in your head with bit nodes on one side check nodes on the other side yi being associated to each bit node okay so that's the tanner graph that i want you to think about okay okay so channel llr yi is kind of assigned to i bit node okay so that is my input to the decoder now the decoder will start have will have to process this input and try to produce some uh, produce c hat basically Okay, so that's what that's what we're trying. Okay, so like like before, we will do bitwise detection. Okay, so we won't try to produce the overall C hat. What will we try to produce? C i hat. Okay, for each bit, we'll try to produce an output. Okay, that's the that's the notion of the bitwise MAP decoder. Okay, the the drawback to that is one can argue that if you only produce C i hat. if you put all of them together you may or may not get a code word right but that's fine we'll just live with that if you have a systematic code word then it's enough if you decode just the message bits and be careful with it. be happy with it right any any as far as message bits are concerned every sequence is possible i don't have to worry about worry about a valid message sequence right? so one can do that in practice so it's not a big deal so that's what we will do once again here okay so another principle that you might remember in our message passing decoder for gallagher a Okay, so in the first iteration, what did we do? Okay, so Y I R I was sent to all the neighboring check nodes. Okay, so one can imagine doing the same thing here in the first iteration. But what was the 
what was the reason for doing that i, I told you something about why you would do that what is the idea in each iteration what what does the bit node try to do yeah exactly the logic was each bit node would send its best estimate of what that bit is to to the neighbors okay in the soft case you will have to change that a little bit each bit node will send its best estimate of the llr of the bit to its checkers okay so that's the change in the soft case since you are dealing with soft messages you going to, you want to send probabilities and not the bit itself okay in the in the hard case you could send the bit itself for the soft case each bit each node will send its best estimate of llr uh, will send its best estimate of llr to its neighbors oh sorry to its neighbors okay so that will be a difference between the hard and the soft decoders okay what llr you might ask okay so if the bit node is sending something it will send its estimate the esti best estimate of its llr that bits llr what what happens when the check node is sending what llr will the check node send check node doesn't have any llr right what happened in the what happened in the galagher a case what what bit did the check node send yeah it's estim estimate of what the recipient was okay so same thing will happen here for the check node it will send the llr of that bit okay so whichever bit is receiving that message that bits llr the check node will try to send okay so that logic we will use once again another logic we will carry over from galagher a is we will not resend the information okay if you know ahead of time that if you received some information from a particular bit node you will not try to send it back to the same bit node you will only try to send new information okay so the same uh, that's that's needed for maintaining <laughs> independence right so you will avoid resending information okay all these three principles we will use okay and as i said the decoder will be iterative each decoder each iteration will have two steps that will also happen okay all these things we will use and try to develop a message passing decoder okay so let's do that right earnest okay iteration 1 is the easiest iteration 1 step a is the easiest right what happens in iteration 1 step a suppose you have bit node i okay <coughs> let's say the degree is d okay so well degree is not quite relevant here but let's say degree is d okay what do you do in step a of iteration 1 what do you send okay what is what is the only thing that the bit node knows it only knows yi okay and its best estimate of the llr for that bit is just yi there's nothing more that it can do okay so it will send yi to all its neighboring check nodes Okay. Okay. So step B will immediately get interesting. Okay. Suppose you have a check node of degree. I'll use D again, but hopefully you see the difference. Okay. Check node of degree D. Okay. So maybe we'll say E. Okay. So just to just to avoid the same notation. Okay. So I'm going to say the check node has degree E, which means what what would have happened in step a okay so okay i should write step a somewhere okay so let me write step a here in step a this degree e check node okay the same guy as here would have received what yeah exactly it would have received <coughs> Okay, I think I used square for check nodes, right? Sorry for that. Okay, so it would have received, let's say, K 
Okay, I've put dot 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 here. I put too many dot dot dots. Okay, it will receive y1, y2, so on till ye. Okay, so. Oh, you want to write it as yi1, yi2. It's okay, man. Y, y1, y2. <laughs> You're going to be. Okay, so y1 is already something else, right? So you want to write it as. My goodness, you're making me redo this <laughs> so many times. Okay. Okay, we'll do it. It's worth it. It's not a big deal. You can do this. It's good to see all of you are. Keeping pace. Yes. No, the APP LL. No? Probability of CA equals zero. The capital L's log of the capital L. See, the, the two RI by sigma square is just the channel LL. What comes out of the channel? What I want to compute is. The a posteriori LLR, which is probability that CA is 0 given the entire vector R divided by probability that CA is 1 given the entire vector. I am trying to estimate that. I want to compute that. If you only want to compute the intrinsic one, there is no computation to do. You are right. I am right. trying to estimate that. Okay. So now, what should this check node do? Okay. So let us look at the message that it will send to the bit I1. Okay. To the I1th bit, what message it will send? Okay, so what, what does it know? Okay, it has to send something. It has to compute it, and it has received y i two through y i e in the previous iteration. Remember, these were received in the step A, in the previous step of the same iteration. Sorry. Okay, see so in step A. What should it do? <coughs> Remember the principle. What is the principle? It should find the best estimate of LLR for bit i1 can it use y1 yi1 it cannot use yi1 because it knows it came from there so it won't use yi1 it has to only use the remaining bits okay what can it do what else does it know what is the what else does the check node represent yeah so what does it know remember what we used in gallagher a <laughs> we use the fact that all those bits will have to xor to 0 the parity has to be 0 right so we'll have to use that information and the LLRs for the other bits to figure out an LLR for this bit. So that is the problem. Okay. So what else does the check node know? It knows CI1 equals CI2 plus CI3 plus so on till CIE. My addition is modulo 2. Okay. So remember that. It's all XOR. I'm just writing plus, but it's all modulo 2 addition. The check node knows this. Knows that this has to be true. Okay, what is y i 2? y i 2 is has L L R, right? L L R of C i 2. Right? Likewise, the L L R for each guy is y i e. <coughs> okay? Okay? Given the so remember what is log likelihood ratio log of probabilities pro ratio of probabilities given the llr can you go back to the probabilities so suppose i give you the ratio that prob okay suppose i give you probability that c equals 0 divided by probability that c equals 1 can i find the each of those values but there are two variables and only one equation no why you have another equation right if you add those two you should get one so the llr is as good as giving the probability okay so you know the probability that each of these bits on the right hand side is zero or one you have to find the probability that their xor is zero or one you find those two probabilities find their ratio take the log you will get you will get what what you want and that is what you will pass back to the i1 okay is that clear? <coughs> Once more, okay. <laughs> okay, so think about it. In the Gallagher case, what happened? What happened in the Gallagher case? Think about it. All of these guys were bits. 
I happily took an XOR of them and said that was my best estimate of what this i one bit should have been. Now I am given probability that the i two bit is 1 or 0. I am given probability that the i three bit is 1 or 0. Likewise, I am given these probabilities. And then I am also told the i one bit is an XOR of all these things. Can I compute the probability that the i one bit will be 0? Can I compute the probability that the i one bit is 1? If I can compute based on just this information, I compute, I divide, I take the log and send back. That's all. That's all I have to do. It's a very simple definition. Once you understand, once you have, once you have settled comfortably on the principles of message passing, the computation you have to do is very simple. Okay. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So I let's 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 not worry about LLR. We'll go back to LLR later. But for now, we'll just say probability is known. Okay. So and I'll I'll pose this problem in a slightly different way. Okay. I'll take a very simple case of this problem and we'll try to do this computation of LLR and probabilities. Right. We'll do that. Okay. Before that, let me write down this problem in words so that it's it's recorded. Okay. So the calculation at the calculation at check node is what? At any check node, at a check node, check node is basically given LLRs of uh, bits i2 through IE, okay, compute LLR for bit I1 using what? Using the fact that all of them will have to XOR to 0 or using the fact that the I1 bit is the XOR of other bits, okay. Okay, so I have concentrated so much, on, so much on I1. If I solve this computation, can I also do the, do the message to I2? Yeah, so it's the same thing, right? I'll pull I, I2 to this side and keep everything else on that side. Okay, <coughs> right? So this is enough. If I can figure out how to do this computation, that's good enough. And I don't want to do this computation. I don't want to make this computation very expensive. Okay, I want to keep this computation as simple as possible. So you'll see there'll be a lot of algebraic tricks that you use to make the computation as efficient as possible for implementation. Okay, so you'll have to do that. The reason is this needs to be done in every iteration and at every check node for every message that you are sending. So it needs to be done multiple times and it's good to invest some time and simplify this and get it as easy as possible. Okay. So let's start with the toy version of this problem, a very simple version so that we get comfortable with it and then you will see the toy version extends beautifully to the general case. Okay. So this is a toy example. I am going to say x equals y plus z, all of them are binary random variables. Okay, and I'm going to say x is y x odd with z. All of them are binary, and I know I'll say say let's say probability that y equals zero is p y zero, and probability that z equals zero is p z zero. Okay, p z equals zero is p z zero. Probability that y is zero is p y zero. Okay, and I'm also given that x is y plus z. Can you compute probability that x equals z? And I'm given y and z are, are take their values independently. Okay, they are independent random variables. Also given that. Yeah, how will you compute probability that? How will you compute px0? Yeah, so it's as simple as that, right? It's a very elementary computation. So how will you do this? Both will have to be zero. Or both will have to be. 1. Okay, so the toy problem seems really, really clear. But how will I extend this? Suppose I say now, instead of y plus z, I have x equals y1 plus y2 plus y3 plus y3, y4 plus so on till y100. Okay, how will you write down the expression? Okay, so let's try that. That's the next, that's the next example I want to do. Suppose I say x equals y1 plus y2 plus y3 plus so on till some y I'll, I'll take I'll take 100 for fun okay no no problem in this and and p10 is the probability that so so let me say probability that y i is 0 is some p i 0 okay so will you compute p x 0 what should I do okay 
okay so if i do it brute force what is the computation required i need to sum over how many terms how many possibilities do i have to sum over here there were just two cases how many such cases will you have for 100 bits 2 power 99 right 2 power 99 cases and each case will be a product of how many terms 100 terms okay product of 100 terms okay and it seems like there is even no reasonable way of writing down what this expression would be okay so it seems to be a, a problem here so maybe maybe i need more efficiency maybe this px0 equals py0 pz0 plus 1 minus py0 1 minus pz0 is not as efficient as it should be if it if it were to be the most efficient form then i won't get any simplification okay so the key to looking at that is to do the following okay so let me see i think this should work out okay let's go back to re, re let's revisit one and try to see if this computation can be made any simpler than what it looked like okay so well i can also develop this trick in a more formal way but i think the trick is to try to compute px0 minus px1 try to compute that tell me what it is hoping there will be something better than that. Yeah, if you add them, you will get one. Now. What does this work out to? Times. Okay, then that's fine. Okay, I like that expression. I'll write it slightly differently. So you're saying it is one minus two times py py zero. Okay, so I don't like that too much. So I'll write that as one minus py zero minus py zero. So what is one minus py zero? Py one. So I'll write it as py one minus py0 times is it py1 minus py0 or py0 minus py1 but both ways are okay right so so work work it out a little bit and show that this expression is true okay did enough of you get this okay so it's a very simple derivation to show that this expression is true Okay, so it basically it worked out because you could factor the difference very easily okay, and it worked out in a nice way. Okay, so check your calculations if you did not find this to be true and it will work out. Okay. <coughs> so what is the advantage of this form? Now if I revisit 2, what can I write it as? The reason is in this form, I can add one more variable to this without worrying about anything. Right? This form extends to as many summations as I want. If I now add y plus z plus say w, y plus z I know how, then when I add w, what is it that I am doing? I, I have to have multiplied once again, right? It extends wonderfully in a very obvious way. So when you revisit 2 now, you can happily write px0 minus px1 as what? Product pi0 minus pi1. i equals 1, 2. <coughs> Am I right? Okay, so this is way way better than doing whole bunch of uh, additions over uh, 2 power 99 terms. It's quite wonderful to see that such a nasty expression can simplify when you view it differently. 
okay so from here on you have to do some algebra to convert this into llr language this is purely in probability language right right this is just probability px0 minus px1 but what do i want i want px0 divided by px1 in fact log of that that's what i want okay so we have to do some exercise to convert it into llr language and that is not too too difficult but one can use some further simplifications here for instance i can so i i'll, I'll show you how it is typically done okay so you may or may not like this uh, like the way it's typically done but that's that simplifies in llrs it will turn out that multiplication will become addition okay so you can imagine when in, in empty when just probabilities when you are multiplying when you take log of those probabilities it will become addition so an addition is easier for us but but there's one more complication to that it won't become a very simple way i'll have to do something to it so let me try to do that in the next 10 minutes it's just pure algebraic exercise hopefully i won't get uh, uh, i won't get uh, confused on the way we'll see okay so the first first trick is to divide by px0 plus px1 can i divide on the left hand side by px0 plus px1 that's just one okay so i'm just not doing anything different just dividing by one and then writing one differently as px0 plus px1 okay so i'll do that i'll do that in the next step why do you think i want to divide by px0 by px1 yeah so now when i divide i will get some convenient stuff with llrs because otherwise when it i how can i divide i can't divide right if i divide on the left i have to divide on the right i don't know what will happen on the right division okay but if i divide by px0 plus px1 i can just divide numerator and denominator and get llrs happily okay so on the right hand side what will i divide each term i'll divide by pi0 plus pi1 okay so there's no problem these are all simple tricks but but they are useful finally in the simplification okay so now each expression can be comfortably converted into likelihood ratio so how will i do that i'll divide by px1 the numerator and the denominator on the left hand side on the on the right hand side each term i'll divide by pi1 if i do that i get what what do i get the likelihood ratio of x right minus 1 divided by the likelihood ratio of x plus 1 see now once i divide the denominator is not 1 anymore okay so it becomes something else you can't throw it out okay you should be careful okay after i divide the denominator is not 1 anymore before i divided it is 1 now when i divide it will become something which is not 1 okay li minus 1 divided by li plus 1 so <coughs> okay so so from we have gone to likelihood ratio but we want what log likelihood ratio okay so what is how will you convert it into log likelihood ratios what is lx in terms of the log likelihood ratio e power yx right e power yx and here li will be e power y i okay so let's do that it's just a series of simple steps so you get e power y x minus 1 divided by e power y x plus 1 equals product of i equals 1 2 well i'm doing 100 but you remember this 100 can be replaced by any other number right so eventually i'll do that e power uh, y i minus 1 divided by e power y i plus 1 <coughs> okay so so it's also common to write these expressions by uh, what should i do i should multiply and divide by e power minus yx by 2 okay so it's common to do that so that you get a tan hyperbolic form okay so this is not a very standard form if you're happy with this form it's fine i mean there's no problem but uh, it's, it's it's usual to convert this into tan hyperbolic how will you do that you multiply and divide by e power minus yx by 2 Okay, so you do that on the left hand side, you will get tan hyperbolic of what do you get? Y x by two equals product i equals one to hundred tan hyperbolic of y i by that's it. okay. <coughs> okay, it's very clear. 
So it's no problem now. So all you have to do at the receiver is be able to take tan hyperbolic. Okay, what, what how do you how do you figure out yx from yi now? If I give you yi alone, you have to compute yx, what will you do? You have to divide by 2, take tan hyperbolic, do a lot of multiplications, and then do what? Take inverse tan hyperbolic, you will get yx by 2. Okay. But uh, there is a way to speed this up even further. Okay. So for, for instance, tan hyperbolic is can be both positive and negative, right? So less than zero, it will be negative. For greater than zero, it will be positive. So directly, you can't take logarithms, right? When you have positive and negative, when you multiply, you can't take logarithms. You have to separate the sign first, and then take. Look at the magnitudes and take. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So this tan hyperbolic will have a sign and a magnitude. If you just take magnitude on both sides, you can do multiplication and then take logarithms to simplify your multiplication. Okay, otherwise you can't do it. But when you take magnitude, you're losing the sign, so you have to keep track of sign also. So from here, people will usually go into sign and magnitude. This is done once again to simplify your calculation. So what will be the sign equation? So suppose I say uh, SI is sine of well, sine of tan hyperbolic is the same as sine of x, right? So, how many of you know? See, tan hyperbolic is e power x uh, minus 1 divided by e power x plus 1. If x is positive, tan hyperbolic will also be positive. If x is negative, tan hyperbolic will also be negative. So, sine of tan hyperbolic of something is the same as sine of that something itself. Okay, it's an it's whatever function. Okay, so it works out in a very nice fashion. So. Suppose I say SA is the sine of YA and SX is the sine of YX. Okay, so the sine equation will be what? SX equals product I equals 1 to 100 SI. Do you agree? That is one equation that will come out just based on sines. Okay, the magnitude will be <coughs> what? See, since it's anyway. Again, even fun, I mean, uh, sign depends on only the argument. The magnitude I can take inside. Can I take inside? So it will have to be an odd function. No, is this tan hyperbolic an odd function? Right? You must, you must remember the way tan hyperbolic looks. So I can take the magnitude inside my uh, tan hyperbolic argument if I want. But if you're not comfortable, just keep it outside. Okay? So it doesn't matter. But it's it's good to take it inside so that you'll see there'll be a final simplification. Okay, so you'll get log tan hyperbolic of absolute value of y x by two equals what? Product will become what now? Summation y equals one to hundred log tan hyperbolic absolute value of y i by oops. Is that clear? Okay, so this is just a simple simplification. This is mere algebra here. There's nothing more to it. But pay attention to it. It's quite important. If I call a function f of x as now log tan hyperbolic of absolute value of x by 2, I want you to evaluate mod x in terms of f of x and tell me what that function looks like. Basically, invert this. Do it. <coughs> Try to simplify a little bit. So basically, don't simply say tan hyperbolic inverse and all. Write it out. You'll get the final simple form. That's why I'm asking you to do it. Not Give me x x by two. Do you get by two? You get a by two. No? Oh, you're getting two, huh? I want f to be its own inverse, so I should do something else. Oh, it should work out to be its own inverse, no? Doesn't it work out? Look at that carefully. You should get a fx by 2, no? Will you, get, will you not get fx by 2? You don't get it. Right? Oh, it will get, you will get a 2, is it? <coughs> okay. Anyway. <coughs> what is the expression? Mod x is? 2 log tan hyperbolic fx, is it? 
Okay, I know there's a way of writing it so that f becomes its own inverse. Is this okay or is there some mistake? I thought this form itself worked out to be its own inverse. Yeah, Fx by 2, no? Yeah, I think that is, that sounds better to me. Yeah, you should get Fx by 2. See, e power x, x minus 1 by e power x plus 1 is not equal to tan hyperbolic of x. It's tan hyperbolic of x by 2. You have to do the, be careful with that. Okay? So, this Fx is its own inverse. So, what does it mean? So, this function, see, see, if, if you did not know this fact, what, you, what would you have done? Given the yi's, you would have done yi by 2, then taken log tan hyperbolic and added up the whole thing. And then you would have done log tan hyperbolic inverse. Now it turns out you don't have to do that. You don't have to do the log tan hyperbolic inverse. It's enough if you do what? Yeah, so it's enough if you write mod of yx equals f of summation i equals 1 to 100 f of yi. Because the function is its own inverse. Okay, you do f on both sides. On the left hand side, you will get mod yx. On the right hand side, you get f of whatever you had. Okay, so you can imagine this being useful in implementation point of view. So ultimately, this f is a nonlinear function. You are not going to be evaluating it using some Taylor series or something. What will you do in practice when you implement this? You will have a lookup table. So you do not have to have two different lookup tables for doing the inverse. It is enough if you have just one lookup table for this one f, you can do the full implementation very easily. And beyond that lookup table, what is the only other operation you have to do? Addition, okay, which is not too bad in today's uh, uh, technology. Okay, so so this is a simplification for this. Go back, stare at it for a while, and then I'll come uh, come back next class and put it together with the remaining part of the soft decoder, and we'll get a complete algorithm. Okay.